meeting of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Europe and Regional Security Cooperation will come to order. I want to thank everyone for their patience. Of course, since we are having a hearing today, we are also having votes this afternoon. So we are in the middle of two votes, um, which is why Senator Ricketts was a little delayed. Um, and at some point, we are likely going to have to uh, take turns going to do the second vote once it's called. But we appreciate everyone's being here. And I want to thank Ranking Member Ricketts for agreeing to hold a hearing on this topic. He and I got a chance to go to Vilnius last year for the NATO summit, so I know he feels strongly about NATO, as do I. In July, leaders from North America and Europe will come to Washington to celebrate the accomplishments of 75 years of NATO. It's the greatest collective security alliance in history. And what started as 12 countries in 1949 has more than doubled in the years following its creation. NATO is now 31 member countries strong, soon to be 32 with Sweden's accession. Most recently, the alliance welcomed two nations from the Western Balkans, Montenegro and North Macedonia, and more recently than that, Finland. Soon, we hope to formally welcome Sweden into the fold. Its success as a defensive alliance can be marked by the collective peace and economic prosperity at home over the past 75 years. And contrary to some uninformed voices who will try to say otherwise, NATO's Article 5, which provides for collective self-defense, has only been invoked once in the history of the alliance. That was by the United States when we asked our allies to come to our defense after the horrific terror attacks on September 11, 2001. Those attacks killed nearly 3,000 Americans. Now the alliance faces an increasingly dangerous world. Being part of NATO means that our U.S. service personnel are not isolated as we confront emerging challenges from Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China, all of whom have an interest in destabilizing the economy and security of the United States. Unfortunately, there are some in this country and around the world who question our role in NATO or even our need for a transatlantic military alliance. But I want to be clear. I believe our investment in this alliance is an insurance policy for our collective security, and it is at the very heart of America's security and economic interests. Now, we've talked a lot in Washington about burden sharing. All allies should already be meeting, or have a plan to meet, the commitment reaffirmed in Vilnius last year to spend at least 2% of gross domestic product on defense spending, and we can see on the chart behind me where those members stand and they show that progress is happening. Um, member countries are continuing to increase their defense spending. Many have realistic plans to meet the 2% commitment in the coming years. And while these increases are impressive, the United States must continue to encourage European and our Canadian allies to continue their work to meet their commitment to spend 2% of their gross domestic product on defense spending. Reaching agreement on how to position the transatlantic alliance to better support Ukraine, counter China's economic role in Europe, and shore up other aspirant and partner countries like Georgia and Bosnia-Herzegovina is also critical. That the NATO alliance is only growing is proof that Putin made many miscalculations when he decided to invade Ukraine. He thought his attack would divide the alliance. Instead, NATO is more united than ever before. Together, the United States, Canada, and our European allies have collectively provided over $76 billion in security assistance to Ukraine, with European allies stepping up further to welcome refugees and maintain Ukraine's economic lifelines. Meanwhile, Ukraine is fighting Russian aggression without asking the United States and other NATO countries for boots on the ground. The inclusion of Finland and soon Sweden will bolster NATO's capabilities in responding to Putin's malign actions in Ukraine and across Europe. And I would hope that Hungary will swiftly ratify Sweden's accession to the alliance. They are the only NATO country yet to do that. 
So I'm looking forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses. And with that, I'll turn to Ranking Member Ricketts for his comments. Thank you, Madam Chair, and agree with you on the swift approval from Hungary. Uh, I want to start by reading an excerpt from a 1964 New York Times article entitled The NATO Success Story. Fifteen years ago today, in a historic departure from isolation, the United States signed the North Atlantic Treaty and entered into peacetime precisely the kind of entangling alliance against which George Washington had warned. It had taken two world wars, the emergence of the Soviet threat, the descent of the Iron Curtain, the communist seizure of Czechoslovakia, and the Berlin, Berlin blockade to make America realize that their future was inextricably linked to that of Europe. This is a lesson we can forget only at our peril, despite the many changes and new challenges the world has seen since 1949. And here, 60 years later, since this article has been written, uh, as we approach NATO's 75th anniversary and the upcoming Washington Summit, many of these lessons are as apparent today as they were on the 15th anniversary and are just as relevant. The Soviet aggression, the threat that helped spawn the formation of NATO, has emerged once again, only this time as Russian imperialism. Putin's calculus for his war in Ukraine was predicated in part on the assumption that transatlantic ties were fractured, the willpower of the West was lacking, and that NATO was a relic of the past. Clearly, he made a grave miscalculation. His aggression has rejuvenated the alliance, leading to the admission of Finland and hopefully Sweden. NATO's unified response with the help of other like-minded countries has blunted Putin's ambitions for now. Still, if not clearly defeated in Ukraine, Moscow will continue with its conquest, which directly threatens NATO allies. That's why it's so critical we continue to provide Ukraine with the weapons it needs to win. On that front, our European allies should be lauded for the vast support they have provided. However, the war has also highlighted NATO's longstanding Achilles heel that Europe remains disproportionately dependent on U.S. security. If NATO is to remain the most successful military alliance in world history, it will largely depend on how it addresses this shortcoming, starting with defense spending. Fair burden sharing has been NATO's DNA since the strategic concept stated that each nation's contribution should be in proportion to its means. At the 2014 Wales Summit, allies pledged to spend at least 2% of their GDP on defense by 2024. So far, the results, as of last year, only 11 members, including the United States, met that target. Even if additional NATO allies get there by the Washington summit, the effort will still likely receive a failing grade. NATO's European members in Canada have a combined GDP roughly equal to the U.S. and a larger total population, yet they still only account for about 30 percent of the bloc's defense spending. I'm especially concerned that Canada continues to cut defense spending and still does not have a plan to reach 2 percent. This is unfair to U.S. taxpayers. It's also unsustainable for NATO to be effective, to be effective in achieving its ambitious goals laid out in Madrid and Vilnius. At no point during or after the Cold War did the U.S. and NATO have to deal with large, a large-scale war in Europe, let alone a People's Republic of China that is powerful motiva and motivated enough to threaten international security and the international system that has created peace and prosperity since World War II. Frankly, the reality is that our ability to defend Europe will increasingly be constrained as we move to address the threats from the PRC. We will likely have to increase our military focus on the Indo-Pacific, and Europe needs to help step up with its defense. Strategic autonomy is not the answer, but neither is the status quo. This effort will likely require greater involvement, cooperation, and understanding from the EU, increased bilateral and multilateral coordination, and ultimately the political will from our NATO allies to radically transform their approach and execution on defense. In addition, though Russia must remain NATO's priority, the alliance should do also do more to address the threat the PRC poses to transatlantic security, including strengthening our cooperation with the Asia-Pacific Four. To conclude, the challenges to the transatlantic and global security posed by authoritarian regimes like Russia and the People's Republic of China are immense. However, there is one area that they will never be able to compete with us on, and that is our alliances. We have allies that are worth having. For 75 years, NATO has successfully anchored our alliance system. Article 5 has only been triggered once, as the chair already noted, by our allies on behalf of the United States on September 11th. To ensure that remains the case, NATO must evolve and adapt, as it has throughout history, 
to rise to the challenge of today's increasingly dangerous world. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how NATO can do so at the upcoming Washington Summit and beyond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Ricketts. Before I turn it over to the witnesses, let me give um, the chair of the full Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Cardin, who is here, the opportunity to give an opening statement. Well, well first, I want to thank Senator Shaheen and Senator Ricketts for their leadership on this subcommittee. It's been a very active subcommittee, and we appreciate the fact that they put together this hearing. I want to thank all the witnesses that are here. There's no more important subject today than NATO and the strength of NATO. Uh, the alliance is critically important for our security and for the transatlantic partnership. Uh, for six of our NATO partners, uh, it's more than just uh, a security pact. The only thing standing between those six countries that border Russia and Russia is a border checkpoint. So they recognize the threat. I met with leaders from four of those countries this week, the Baltic states uh, and from Finland, and I can tell you, uh, and I told them, we have their back. NATO has their back. And we also want Russia and PRC to know that these countries have our back. We are fully supporting their efforts. And Madam Chair, I appreciate what you mentioned uh, uh, about uh, Hungary. I met with Ambassador Pressman this morning, uh, thanked him for his strong leadership on behalf of the United States in Budapest and his strong commitment to do everything he can to make sure Hungary acts quickly on the accession. There are other issues we need to deal with in Hungary, and we had a chance to talk about that. But I'm very pleased that we have our witnesses here today, and I'm very pleased this hearing is taking place. Thank you very much, Senator Cardin. Um, I will briefly introduce our, um, all of our speakers who are testifying today. Obviously, we have dramatically reduced their list of accomplishments since we don't have all day to, to introduce everyone. Um, so recognize that these are just brief introductions. Retired Ambassador Doug Lute is also a retired three-star general in the United States Army. He was the permanent U.S. representative to NATO from 2013 to 2017. He previously served in the White House over two administrations, including as coordinator for South Asia and as deputy national security advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan. As an Army officer, Ambassador Lute was director of operations on the Joint Staff, director of operations at U.S. Central Command, had several tours as a NATO commander, and served in combat during Operation Desert Storm. Thank you. Um, Luke Coffey is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute who's focused on Europe, Eurasia, NATO, and transatlantic relations. Mr. Coffey was previously director of the Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies and the Margaret Thatcher Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, a senior special advisor at the UK Ministry of Defense, I think the first non-Brit there, and a U.S. Army officer, and I understand your son is here behind you today, is that correct? We're so glad you could be here for your dad. Tara Varma is a visiting fellow at the Center of the United States and Europe at Brookings. She was previously the head of the Paris Office of the European Council on Foreign Relations and part of the working group on the French European Council Presidency. In November 2023, Varma was awarded the Honor of Knight of the National Order of Merit of France. That has a really nice ring to it. Yeah. Um, so, again, thank you all for being here in person. And Ambassador Lute, I'm going to turn it over to you to make the first statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. Uh, it's my pleasure to discuss with you in the committee today NATO as its 75th anniversary approaches. I'll address three main points NATO's contributions the most significant challenge it now faces, and its importance to America in the future. Uh, Madam Chair, as you mentioned, NATO is the most successful, most durable collective defense alliance in world history. The NATO summit in Washington in July will be a fitting opportunity to remember and acknowledge NATO's contributions over the past 75 years. One might divide those years into three phases, or perhaps NATO 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. So in NATO 1.0, the first 40 years, from 1949 to uh, 1989, uh, in the wake of World War II, uh, NATO stood as the defensive bulwark against the Soviet Union in Europe. This defense provided the time and space America's European allies needed to recover from the war, solidify their democracies, and become prosperous again, and eventually to integrate into the European Union, 
America's largest trading partner. The world experienced an historic pivot point with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the reunification of Germany a year later, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. Over the next 25 years, this post-Cold War period, or NATO 2.0, saw NATO adapt to new challenges not foreseen in 1949. NATO welcomed as members newly free countries of the Warsaw Pact and even former republics of the USSR, which, when given the opportunity, chose to become democracies and NATO allies. Beyond new members, NATO established partnerships with dozens of other states under the principle that NATO is more secure when its neighborhood is more stable. NATO intervened in the Balkans, first in Bosnia, later in Kosovo, to stop conflicts and provide stability. Most significant for the United States, as has already been mentioned, NATO immediately stood by our side when we were attacked on 9-11, invoking from the only time in history Article 5 of the treaty, fulfilling the pledge that an attack on one is an attack on all. For the next 20 years, NATO stood with the United States in Afghanistan. NATO 3.0 began with the Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2014, the illegal annexation of Crimea and the, destabiliz the destabilization of the Donbas. Certainly by Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the world again experienced a strategic inflection point. For the first time since the Second World War, large-scale conventional war in Europe threatened the existence of a nation state. If 2014 was the overture, 2022 was the main event. We are still in the early years after this eruption, this, this volcano in the international system, and we should expect aftershocks, political, economic, and security, to reverberate for years to come. It's already clear that Russia's blatant aggression and disregard for every international rule of the road since the United Nations Charter is the most significant challenge NATO and the free world face today. In six months, NATO leaders will convene here in Washington to celebrate 75 years since the treaty was signed in Washington in 1949. More important than celebrating, however, these leaders will confront the most severe threat to the world NATO has kept guard over for almost eight decades, the war in Ukraine. Every NATO summit strives to demonstrate the cohesion and unity of the alliance. I expect we'll discuss today a range of issues that challenge that cohesion, adding Sweden as NATO's 32nd member, fulfilling requirements for the new regional defense plans, allies' progress towards meeting resource goals, and even selecting the next Secretary General. I'm confident that allies will find their way through these issues, perhaps even before the summit in July. Most important, however, will be what the Washington summit decides to do about Ukraine. There are two ways to think about NATO's relationship to Ukraine. What is the minimum necessary? And what is the best possible? In my view, NATO members must provide Ukraine with the military, economic, and political support to win the war. This commitment requires discarding the incremental support over the past two years and shifting to a concept of as long as it takes, with as much as it takes, when it is needed. So a new approach is needed. So far, the United States-led coalition has provided Ukraine enough military support not to lose, but not enough for Ukraine to win. A stalemate on the ground in Ukraine plays to Russia's long war attrition strategy. Moving towards best possible, I believe that along with increased military support to Ukraine, NATO should provide at the Washington summit a concrete step that demonstrates that Ukraine will be a member of the alliance. I submit for the record a recent publication by the Atlantic Council that offers an innovative approach on how NATO might do this. Such an approach would be a signal not only to the Ukrainian people, a signal of reassurance, but a very important signal to the Kremlin that the long war strategy will fail. These measures of support for Ukraine represent the most significant deliverables of the Washington summit. As the summit approaches, this committee has asked for suggestions on how to support Ukraine's fight for survival. I offer three suggestions. 
Most urgently, as already uh, I'm, I'm sure fully appreciated, Congress must pass additional U.S. funding for military support. This is Ukraine's lifeline. It is not a charity. It is a direct contribution, a direct investment in NATO and American security. As we all know, most of this money is spent in the United States, in congressional districts, in states. Um, but the effects are felt in Ukraine. And complementing this funding would be expanding authorities for the administration to approve third-party transfer of US-provided military capabilities from allies and partners to Ukraine. So allowing those transfers or even expediting such transfers. The SFRC approved last week the Repo Act, which I broad, uh, widely uh, applaud, to transfer seized Russian assets to support Ukraine. Passing this in measure into law would be a clear message to our allies and partners and to the Kremlin that Russian aggression will not stand. And third, prioritizing the expansion and enforcement of economic sanctions against Russia is vitally important to demonstrate to the Kremlin that its long war attrition strategy cannot succeed. In particular, we should crack down on the reflagging of Russian oil exports that evade sanctions. And in closing, as NATO approaches its 75th anniversary, polling shows strong bipartisan and enduring public support for the alliance. Americans intuitively understand the value of NATO. When confronting challenges beyond our borders, America's greatest advantage is our network of alliances, beginning with NATO. Today, as we confront Russian aggression, and in the decades to come, as we compete with China, America has a geostrategic advantage that neither can match our allies, friends, and partners. The United States must preserve and even cherish this strategic asset, and the Washington summit in July is an opportunity to do so. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member, and distinguished members of this committee. I'm honored to speak before this committee on the subject of NATO. Madam Chair, I will summarize my prepared statement that has been already submitted for the record. Before any discussion of NATO can take place, it is important to remember why Europe, and ex by extension, the alliance, is important to the United States. North America and Europe together account for about 48% of the global economy. Europe is America's single largest export market. In 2022, 45 out of 50 states exported more to Europe than they did to China. Even Pacific states like California and Hawaii exported twice as many goods to Europe as to China. New York exported eight times more, Florida six, Texas three. And Europe also matters to the American heartland. For example, if you are a worker from Missouri, Illinois, or Kentucky, the fruits of your labor are about four times more likely to be exported to Europe than they are to China. Madam Speaker, when Americans build something to be exported, that preserves and creates American jobs. And right now, Russia is trying to undermine the stability in Europe that has allowed for economic prosperity across the continent, which not only benefits the US economy, but ultimately the American worker. In simple terms, NATO matters because it is the primary security guarantor of America's largest export market. Now, as NATO leaders gather in Washington, D.C. to mark the 75th anniversary of the alliance, burden sharing in Ukraine will feature high up on the agenda. Madam Chair, I will take these two issues in turn. Over the years, low defense spending across Europe has led to a significant loss of defense capabilities and embarrassing shortcomings in military readiness. In 2006, NATO agreed to spend 2% of GDP on defense. This goal was reaffirmed in 2014 with a deadline of 2024. As this year's summit approaches, NATO has had mixed results on this front. When Russia first annexed Crimea in 2014, only three members met the 2% of GDP mark. Since 2014, however, there has been a year-on-year -year increase in defense spending across Europe. This is good news, but more needs to be done. While there is no easy answer to address the defense spending issue, one new approach the alliance should take is getting the finance ministers or their equivalent more involved. Unlike in the US where the legislative branch holds the powers of both authorization and appropriations for government spending, 
In most parliamentary democracies in Europe, finance ministers hold these purse strings. Introducing finance ministers into the NATO world would help them understand why defense is so expensive and why the geopolitical stakes are so high. This is why at the upcoming Washington summit, there should be a special session for finance ministers. Yes, the lack of defense spending among our European partners is frustrating, but stability in Europe, which NATO provides, is too important for the American economy to simply dismiss the alliance as a lost cause. Ukraine is another issue that will feature prominently at the summit. NATO has underpinned the transatlantic security for 75 years, so it's no surprise that many countries in the region who are not already members of NATO want to join the alliance. Expectations were high leading up to last year's Vilnius summit for Ukraine, only to result in disappointment when the alliance failed to deliver a clear path for eventual membership. For better or for worse, the success or the failure of the Washington summit will be determined by what the alliance does or does not do about Ukraine. Most members do not want Ukraine to formally join the alliance while Kyiv is in an active war with Russia. This is understandable. Even President Zelensky acknowledged that Ukraine will not, and I quote, join while the war is waging. Even so, there are still things that NATO can do. At the Washington summit, Ukraine must be given a formal invitation to join the alliance with the final date of membership to be determined once allies agree that the security environment inside the country is satisfactory. I refer members of the committee to my prepared statement submitted for the record for more details on how an invitation can be extended to Ukraine at the summit. An invitation does not mean immediate membership, but it does show commitment. Ukraine has proven through the ballot box and on the battlefield that it sees itself in the transatlantic community. Enlarging the security umbrella in America's largest export market is good for the United States. And now is the time to extend an invitation for Ukraine to join NATO in a realistic and responsible way. With the right creativity, boldness, and leadership, the Washington summit could be one of those moments in world affairs where history is made. In conclusion, NATO needed US leadership for the first 75 years, and the Alliance will need American leadership for the next 75 years. Madam Speaker, I look forward to answering your questions and the questions of the distinguished members of this committee, anything you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Ms. Barma. Chairwoman Shaheen, Ranking Member Ricketts, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Tara Varma, a visiting fellow with the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, where my research focus includes current French and European security developments. I am honored to speak with you today about expectations ahead of the summit. My testimony this afternoon reflects my personal views and should not be attributed to the staff, officers, or trustees of the Brookings Institution. I would like to focus my statement today on three points. First, the state of play before the Washington summit then how Europe has been stepping up, and finally, why we need reinforced EU-NATO cooperation. In July 2022, NATO adopted its latest strategic concept at the Madrid summit, almost five months after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. It laid out NATO's core task as deterrence and defense, crisis prevention and management, and cooperative security. It described the Euro-Atlantic security environment profoundly and durably changed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The swift reactions of the alliance in the immediate aftermath of Russia's attack also demonstrated its vitality and relevance. If the summit in Vilnius last year su succeeded in showcasing strong transatlantic unity and resolve, especially in terms of political cohesion, the question of the future Ukraine-NATO relationship remains open and will certainly be part of the Washington summit discussions too. Key discussions should also revolve around sustained defense equipment, procurement and production, as well as going beyond the 2% threshold. Europe is stepping up. The shock of the attack and the new reality it brought about means mitigating the effects of the previous reality in which national defense spending had fallen in Europe by an average of 31% between 1995 and 2015, with a disinvestment in those capabilities precisely needed for collective defense. Even today, the NATO defense planning process identifies 16 critical major shortfalls areas in the collective investment of allies, including missile defense and air defense capabilities that are sorely needed by Ukraine. 
Europeans acknowledge these capability gaps and are looking at new ways to mitigate them, notably by reaching the unprecedented step of jointly acquiring and producing ammunition and missiles destined for Ukraine. For a political project whose essence was to maintain peace on the continent, these decisions are historical. However, their implementation will take time, and time is precisely what Ukraine doesn't have. European heads of state are meeting tomorrow at the European Council, where I hope they will give Ukraine the long-term, predictable funding it needs. It is of vital interest to Ukraine, and hence it is now of vital interest to Europe too. Europeans should go a step further and make sure that Kiev receives not only the societal and economic aid that it has until now, but military equipment and military aid to protect its critical infrastructures and population. $96 billion were given by the Europeans, in part through the European Peace Facility Mechanism, an off-budget instrument aimed at enhancing the EU's ability to prevent conflict, build peace, and strengthen international security. It also enables the financing of operations, of operational actions that have military or defense implications under the common foreign and security policy. Europeans can, of course, do more in terms of burden sharing, and they have pledged to do so. But let me be clear, we still need US leadership. The viability of NATO as an alliance depends on it, and so does the credibility of its deterrent whose need is pressing while Vladimir Putin attacks Ukraine daily and is hoping transatlantic unity will falter. A strong and stable Europe is in the US's interest beyond the sole borders of the continent. The security of the EU and NATO are interconnected. With Sweden about to become a NATO member, 23 European Union member states will also be NATO members. The addition of Sweden to the alliance will lead to a strengthened Baltic Sea Corridor and the EU has now officially opened accession negotiations with Ukraine, effectively tying Kyiv and the Union's futures together. The transatlantic alliance is rendered stronger by the partnership between the EU and NATO, and EU defense initiatives contribute to transatlantic burden sharing. NATO is and will remain the foundation of collective defense, and a bolstered European defense is complementary to it. Making both organizations stronger is mutually reinforcing and must be done in tandem. In that context, the idea of a European pillar within NATO, meaning that a politically and economically strong Europe should contribute practically equivalent military capacity as the United States to mutual security, will be both a European and an American strategic interest. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Varma, and thank you to all of our witnesses. Um, we have lost people because they call the second vote, so I assume people will come in and out. Um, I will begin the questioning and then turn it over to Senator Ricketts. So, Ambassador Lute, this issue of burden sharing has been challenging, and all three of you addressed it to some extent. Given that you served as U.S. Ambassador during the Wales Summit when the 2% um, defense spend was agreed to, why is it taking some countries so long to reach that amount, and what more can we do to encourage them? Well, thank you for that, Senator. Um, it's taking so long because of the roughly 25 years of atrophy in defense spending among European allies. So it's taking so long because of where they started. It was such a low start point. Um, I do know, however, and I, I think uh, Luke Coffey mentioned, uh, that there have been now, since Wales, uh, 10 consecutive years of real growth among uh, other than American allies, so the, the other uh, NATO allies. Uh, that's significant, and I suspect is historic in the 75 years of NATO history. So there has been progress. Um, but you also mentioned, for example, uh, a, a, as one example, on the lower end of the performance scale, Canada, our neighbor. Um, and if NATO is a, essentially a whole life insurance policy for its member states, then members have to pay the premiums on that insurance policy. And, and at something like 1.3% of GDP, Canada needs to step up. So there's both good news and bad news, but the fundamental answer to your question is we started from a very low point. Um, well, thank you, and, and thank you for mentioning Canada. I happened to be in Halifax um, for the Halifax Security Forum last November, and. Canada had just cut millions of dollars from its defense budget, and we raised a number of questions about um, how 
about their participation in NATO, how they get to the 2%, and how to build um, support in the public to do that. And Ms. Varma, you talked a little bit about the philosophical shift in uh, spending in Europe. What do you think? Is it just the war in Ukraine that has accounted for that, or was that beginning to happen before the war? I think it's mainly due to the war in Ukraine, in Ukraine definitely. Um, the attrition that, I mean, the lack of spending, the decisions really made uh, by European countries not to spend on defense uh, at the end of the Cold War, I think, stem from the sense that the security environment had profoundly changed, not just vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but also in terms of what um, the continent and the political project that the EU was, was supposed to bring about. And so if we were not going to have any wars on the continent, then what was the sense of spending on defense? There were a few, of course, outliers, a number of European countries, member states or not of the EU, who saw things differently, who had a different strategic vision for that. But the EU as, as a union, as a political project, was precisely uh, thought of against geopolitical priorities, against a strategic vision, and, and supposed to bring about a different, a different sort of interactions between human beings. So I think it's, it's, taken quite, it's taken the war in Ukraine for the EU to have this strategic awakening. But it takes time, because we're talking also about very concrete um, uh, issues that need to be changed. We're talking about ramping up production of ammunition and missile. We're talking, so that means unlocking um, funding, that means uh, hiring workers, finding factories, finding the critical raw materials that are needed to build these weapons. So we're talking about actually a time scale that is pr pretty long, and as I said, Ukraine unfortunately doesn't have that long. Um, thank you, and Mr. Coffey, in your opening remarks, you talked about the economic benefit of NATO membership. So as I talk to my constituents in New Hampshire who may question why it's important for the United States to uh, continue to participate and fund NATO, or fund our investment in NATO. How, how, what do you think is the best argument to make for that? Well, Madam Chair, in, in your case, uh, New Hampshire exports more to the UK alone than it does to China, and in fact, uh, pretty much exports the same amount to Ireland than it does to China. Uh, so as I mentioned in my opening statement, when, it, when someone from New Hampshire is building a product or providing a service that's exported, that's a job. And uh, right now, NATO is the ultimate security guarantor for uh, New Hampshire's largest export market. That's why it matters, I would say. Good. Thank you. That's put very succinctly. And I think as, um, I can't remember if it was you or Ambassador Lute who pointed out that um, the funding for the supplemental that is going to help the Ukrainians, much of that money is coming back to the defense base in the United States to create jobs here. Um, Senator Ricketts, I'm going to go vote, so I will turn it over to you and be right back. Great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I've got plenty of material. <laughs> Great. Well, we've, we've talked about this already, uh, but I want to go into it a little bit more with regard to the North Atlantic Treaty. Article 3 states that members will maintain and develop their individual and collective capacity to resist armed attack, and that it's equally important. You know, um, this idea about fair and equitable burden sharing is actually not a new concern. It has been around for a long time. Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy complained about this, and it is achievable. During the Cold War, many European allies routinely spent over 3% of GDP, and so we know that they can get there, uh, Ms. Varma, and General Lute mentioned some of the difficulties, and I think part of it is we all took the peace dividend, and I shouldn't say all, there were company, countries like Finland, who's not obviously just recently part of NATO, they actually didn't stop spending on defense because they've got an 800 mile long border with Russia. So they apparently uh, saw the need to continue. Um, and then, Mr. Coffey, you mentioned that uh, this 2% was first raised in uh, Riga in 2006. I think it was also brought up again in Bucharest in 2008. Um, we talked about Wales in 2014, and it's been 10 years now. Uh, where are we today? We mentioned 11 countries have met their demand there, despite the fact we've got the largest land war in Europe since World War II. And so this is a, a big concern for all of us. Mr. Coffey, you suggested uh, just here that the, at the Washington summit, we gather all the foreign ministers that are equivalent 
to talk about the need to reaching that 2%. Can you go into a little bit more detail about how, if we got them all together at the Washington Summit, that might help, please? Yes, uh, Ranking Member. It wouldn't be a silver bullet, but it would certainly help with the political discussion and debates going back in the national capitals. Uh, you know, in the United States, the, the cabinet position of defense secretary is constitutionally mandated as being a very senior position. Uh, in most European parliamentary democracies, and I don't mean to sound flippant, but the defense minister is often a job that's given to someone who the prime minister owes a favor to. This isn't always the case. But the, but the reality is the defense minister in many European countries does not have the same level of political clout or gravitas inside the cabinet, inside the government, as we are accustomed to here in the United States. But the finance minister certainly does. Uh, this is why I think it's important to get the finance ministers more involved so they can have a better discussion, a, a better informed discussion back in their national capitals on why defense spending is important, why this military kit costs so much, and why it's a good thing that countries choose to invest in their military capabilities. So it wouldn't solve the problem, but I think it would help. Well, I think that's a really interesting insight, especially for us Americans who may not understand what the parliamentary governments are like. I certainly won't claim that I understand. And I think that's an interesting insight. I mean, maybe we should also start inviting the Treasury Secretary and the Fed Chair to come to some of our meetings here with regard to why it's so important that we get there. Um, Russia is dramatically set to increase its defense spending from 3.9 to 6 percent of GDP. What message does it send to Putin if over a third of the alliance, after 10 years here, um, and especially after the war started, aren't getting to 2 percent? Well, Vladimir Putin respects two things, strength and consistency. And right now, NATO is starting to show some strength, and it's early days now to, to, to determine if we're going to be consistent with this. So we are starting uh, uh, right now in, in the wake of the large-scale invasion of Ukraine in the right direction. Now it's up to NATO's leaders to make sure that we continue down this path to get to 2% or even greater, and to give, as Ambassador Lutz said, give the Ukrainians what they need to win and not just what they need to survive. So there have been some talking, uh, some suggestions that NATO should revisit the 2% metric to design better ways of me uh, measuring the contributions. I think, uh, you know, you've talked about how NATO currently calculates defense spending may be already over generous. Can you elaborate on this? And do you believe there needs to be a change in how NATO calculates this? Well, I think the 2% benchmark is a useful one. At least it's a good reference point. I mean, if 2% isn't the right number, the, whatever the average is now, which is well below 2%, we know certainly is not the right number. I think it's worth having a debate inside NATO about how you define what can be used to calculate the 2%. I think it's uh, very outdated. Uh, for example, uh, according to NATO, you can y use... Um, Ministry of Defense civil service pensions to add towards that, that total. Yet, um, in smart investments in regional infrastructure that could help with the movement of, of military equipment or cybersecurity, which touches both the military and civilian sector, are not counted towards this 2%. So maybe we need to hit the refresh on how we define how a country gets to the 2% benchmark. Perhaps at the summit would be a good place to do that. Yeah. And, and certainly, we don't want to take away anything from pensioners who have you know, served their country and so forth, but it's unlikely that they will be the ones that actually go out and have to fight Russia should Russia invade one of our NATO allies. So thank you, Mr. Coffey. Uh, so um, next up is Senator Van Hollen. Thank Over you. Over to you. Uh, thank, thank you, Senator. Thank you all very much uh, for your, your testimony uh, today. Uh, as you well know, one of the big things we're debating right now here in the Senate uh, is the supplemental appropriation, including uh, additional military assistance uh, to the Ukrainians to protect their democracy and their sovereignty against uh, Putin's onslaught. If I could just get a yes, no response from each of you as to uh, whether you agree that continuing support for the Ukrainian people is essential to the credibility of the NATO alliance. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I could not agree more. Um, the NATO uh, Secretary General uh, also 
uh, made some remarks uh, just, I believe, today at the Heritage Foundation, uh, NATO Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg, where he emphasized the point that you all just made, but also made the point that uh, as we address the longer-term challenges uh, posed by a more aggressive China, uh, that it is important uh, that we continue to support the people of Ukraine, not only for the credibility of the NATO alliance and our partners there, but also because our allies in East Asia are watching very closely what we do or don't do, and our adversaries uh, as well. Uh, as he said, uh, today Ukraine, tomorrow Taiwan, meaning President Xi has got one eye on what we're doing in Ukraine and another eye on Taiwan. Uh, I'd just like to ask each of you uh, whether you agree with the statement that you can't say you're being tough on China if you're weak on Ukraine. I agree. Yes, I agree. The, the security of East Asia and Eastern Europe cannot be separated. I agree as well. I think uh, Luke Coffey said that two things matter to Vladimir Putin, strength and consistency. I think the same two things can be said for Xi Jinping. He is looking at what we're doing inside the NATO alliance, how consistent and forceful we are with supporting Ukraine, and any sign that the transatlantic unity falters is going to be a sign for him that he'll interpret in his own way. So I think the best deterrent to China is to keep funding the supplemental and to keep helping Ukraine. I appreciate that many of us have been trying to make that point to our colleagues, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see a unanimous uh, view on, on that. So as you all know, at least so far, I think uh, we would judge that Putin's uh, attack on Ukraine has been a strategic failure. It has helped unite the NATO alliance and increase, uh, enlarge the NATO alliance, uh, most recently uh, Turkey. Um, uh, ratifying uh, Sweden's ascension. So we now have Finland as a me member of NATO. We have Turkey um, supporting uh, both Finland and Sweden now. Uh, but Hungary remains a, a holdout uh, when it comes to uh, ratifying Sweden's ascension to NATO. So if you could talk a little bit about the what mechanisms we should be pursuing when we have a country like Hungary uh, which is holding out right now. They're also, as you know, blocking, I believe it's about $50 billion in euros uh, to support Ukraine. So on the one hand, you know, people have talked about the benefits of expansion of, of NATO over time. On the other hand, uh, when you have a, a country like Hungary uh, that is resisting efforts uh, to support the larger cause, both in terms of uh, Sweden's ascension, but also holding up uh, the euros, the funds to, to Ukraine. What, what recourse uh, do you each recommend that, w that we take? If we could just maybe each of you respond uh, to that. Well, Senator, this is really a vital question that I think uh, the alliance has got to come to grips with. The second sentence of the Washington Treaty says that everybody who signs up for NATO uh, abides by three principles, democracy, individual liberty, and rule of law. And what we've seen recently is that uh, when we bring in members who actually don't abide by those values, the cohesion of the alliance suffers. Um, so the first thing we should do is look carefully uh, in terms of future accessions and make sure that we remember those three values. Um, it doesn't have, however, the treaty doesn't have uh, provisions for policing or disciplining uh, wayward uh, members. And, you know, Hungary is certainly an example, but it's not the only example uh, of a NATO ally who's drifted away from these founding values. Um, I think that a closed door conversation at the Washington summit among the 31, hopefully 32 uh, heads of state and government about values and how, and values are not just rhetoric, they're actually the glue that cements the alliance together. That kind of conversation's gotta happen at the head of state and government level. And I, I'd certainly welcome that sort of thing at Washington. I appreciate that very, very briefly if you, yep. the others have a response. I, I agree with yeah. Ambassador Lute, and I would add that this is, and I'm sure Tara would like to add to this, I'm sure that this is an area where we have to work very closely with our European Union partners because they actually have the tools and the mechanisms 
uh, that are appropriate in this case to um, apply pressure. Understood. Yes, actually the European Union said that it had a nuclear deterrent that it was going to activate against Hungary and that is basically putting financial sanctions on Hungary or arm twisting it in a way, um, saying that it's going to withhold the funds that Hungary is entitled to until it falls in line in a way. Until now, the European Union has been very reluctant to do so. European Union heads of state and government are meeting tomorrow at the European Council and they've been very clear that this option now is, is very much on the table. They've been public about it, so I, I hope it will work. I was pleased to see that, you know, NATO, it's not easy to get in, but as all of you have just stated, it's uh, really hard to uh, penalize somebody, a member who is not cooperating with the, the greater uh, objective. Thank you all very much. Uh, Senator Menendez. Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. Mr. Coffey, what's your son's name? It's Henry. Henry, I must tell you, if my children would have listened to me as intently as you listened to your dad when he was testifying, things would be so much better. So <laughs> I commend you. You look very, very sniffy. That's uh, very kind of you, Senator. I should say. Um, yeah, he was very intent on what you were saying. I don't know if he fully understood it all, but he was very intent while, you know, while you were speaking. He prepared my remarks. Did, did he? Okay. <laughs> well, we got a good future then in the country. Uh, so uh, I want to follow up on, on Senator Van Hollen's remarks because I raised this question uh, to Jen Stoltenberg uh, uh, a while back. I, part of the context was Turkey's belligerent attitude towards Greece, a fellow NATO ally, uh, and its commentary there, but certainly Hungary. Uh, as well as it relates to its um, uh, own challenges of living up to the principles that are part of the alliance. And it, it seems to me that something has to be done on this regard, because if not in the long term, uh, it's going to be a continuing challenge. And, it's, and one of the things that I think that they could come to some agreement is that if you don't live up to those principles, then your vote uh, is suspended until that time in which you do. Uh, because in the absence of having something tangible, then a country, using Hungary just as by way of example, has no reason, unless the Europeans do what they are now considering, has no reason not to hold up for the works. Sometimes out of philosophy, sometimes uh, out of just pure leverage. And unless the alliance uh, thinks about how it's going to meet this challenge, um, it, it's going to be an issue, especially as we look at future expansion, right? Uh, some of the countries that are coming in now, Sweden and Finland, that's not an issue, but you never know. So uh, I think it, it merits a lot of consideration. Um, you, I think you all, I stayed for two of your three testimonies, I had to go vote for yours, Ms. Farmer, but you all have the belief that in this upcoming summit, that uh, some process should be offered to Ukraine for a future in NATO. Is that fair to say? Yes. 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 Yeah. And so the question then becomes, wh wh what is that process? Uh, is it a merely an invitation with a long-term you know, opportunity? Is it something more substantial? Is it something that is just another stronger statement that its future is in NATO? Uh, what, what would be desirable to walk away from the summit, especially at this point in time where, uh, with Ukraine and its challenges that it has with Russia? Well, Senator, you're right. Um, we can't say much more in a very different way than what we've been saying since 2008 at the Bucharest summit. So 15 years have passed, and we've continually said at every NATO summit that Ukraine will be a member. So that's plain English. The question now is, can we offer since Ukraine's in an active conflict, can we offer a measure, a measurable step, a concrete step towards that membership without actually uh, crossing, the, crossing the line and uh, having NATO uh, offer an invitation itself, which most I will not gain consensus, quite frankly, right? I think one innovative approach could be to take a, take a, uh, a step from the EU accessions process Right? and offer at the Washington summit the beginning of accession talks, which is unusual. Accession talks in NATO background are typically very brief, after invitations. It's almost a bureaucratic check of the box. Uh, but in this case, especially since those accession talks are underway between Ukraine and the EU, NATO could move in parallel with the EU, and Zelensky could leave the Washington summit 
with a second set of accession talks. I think that's meaningful. And at the Vilnius summit, they actually agreed um, the NATO-Ukraine Council, which could be the venue, could be the platform for these accession talks. So that's what I'd propose, that we agree on accession talks. I see. And let me, one last final question in my last 30 seconds here. Uh, Ambassador Lute, in 2016, you stated that there was, quote, no chance of NATO expansion because of fears it could destabilize Russia. That was 2016. Obviously, the world has changed uh, from then. What's your assessment of uh, the alliance in terms of expansion destabilizing Russia? I, I, I would think that that's not the case anymore, right? I, I think Russia has actually answered that question for us, right? That what we've seen is that when given, if given the uh, threats from Russia, uh, as evidenced first in 2014 and, and now obviously in, uh, in 2022, uh, that, that those who aspire to membership have been convinced that the only path to security is through membership. And of course, the most obvious examples here are Finland and Sweden. Uh, I think given what happened in 22, uh, that the only path for European security is to offer the same opportunity to Ukraine. I, I just don't, I can't imagine a future where Ukraine is somehow neutralized or s considered secure given what has happened, unless it were a member of NATO. My time is up. I, I have quite, I'll put questions for the record on China uh, and NATO, as well as uh, the Middle East, and I would be interested in your answers. Thank you. Senator Menendez, you're welcome to take since it's just the three of us, feel free to okay. take a little uh, more time. Well, I, Madam Chair, I'll take that offer any day. Uh, uh, so let me ask, uh, in 2021, NATO for the first time identified systemic challenges posed by China's assertive behavior and coercive policies. And since then, it has sought to enhance cooperations with governments in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, including Australia, Japan, New Zealand, South Korea. It strengthened resilience guidelines for member states, including for critical infrastructure and supply chains to maintain NATO's technological edge. Um, and I'd offer this to anyone on the panel. What steps uh, and additional steps can the alliance take to address challenges posed by China? And what type of agreement is there within the alliance on the extent of these challenges? Uh, Senator, uh, there isn't, um, there's limited consensus on how China should be addressed and, and, and treated inside the alliance. However, I would like to add that while the member states of NATO need to be very aware of what China is doing around the world, we have to realize that as an intergovernmental security alliance, NATO as an institution lacks many of the policy competencies that are required to deal with these challenges. For example, questionable investments in 5G in Europe, dubious investments in port infrastructure in Europe. These aren't issues that NATO as an institution is designed nor has the policy competencies to address. The member states do, in some cases the European Union does, but NATO doesn't. And often with NATO, when we expect it or want it to do something that it was never designed to do, that's when we become disappointed by it. So while NATO needs to be aware of what uh, China is doing, its member states and the European Union need to really lead on this right now until China becomes a military threat, and I'm going to quote the 1949 treaty here, in the North Atlantic area north of the Tropic of Cancer. When China becomes a military threat in this area, then NATO as a security alliance has a direct role. But right now, it should be encouraging its member states to do more at the national level. Yes, yeah, Senator, if I may, to follow up on Luke's point, the first step here is transparency. I mean, we should, in the public eye, disclose Chinese investments in mass communications infrastructure, transportation, and energy infrastructure, and so forth. Many of these many of these sectors, economic sectors, are dual purpose, both military and civilian. So the first thing we ought to do is be very clear and public about where China's investing uh, and what its intent is, because these commercial investments today are accompanied with a political down payment later. Uh, and we've seen this time and again in the Belt and Road Initiative and so forth, that a commercial investment, a, a lucrative loan today, uh, has this ex 
expectation that there'll be a political payoff down the road. So we should be much more transparent. So I'm taking advantage of the chair lady's uh, offer, one final question. In December, uh, Secretary Stoltenberg made a historic trip to Saudi Arabia um, and um, becoming the first sitting Secretary General to visit an Arab state. Uh, what challenges would NATO have uh, in uh, establishing cooperation with Arab nations uh, as Iran-backed militia groups continue to uh, sow chaos in the region? I, I applaud that he went, but it uh, seems to me that it's a, a totally different challenging theater uh, for NATO's uh, engagement. What, what are your thoughts? Well, um, among the some 40-some partners states with NATO, so not members, but associates, if you will. Uh, there are Arab states. There's a handful of Arab states, but not yet Saudi Arabia. And what those partner states get from the alliance is access to NATO standards, sort of the gold standard in terms of military operations and equipment. They gain access uh, on a partner basis to the school system uh, and so forth. And they, they essentially learn from NATO what right looks like. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that I think Saudi Arabia could benefit from, but Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, um, the UAE are all today uh, NATO partners, and they have access to that sort of NATO standardization. And I would like to add to that that not only does this year mark the 75th anniversary of, of NATO, it also marks the 20th anniversary of something called the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative, which is the main uh, f platform that NATO uses to engage with uh, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, and the UAE. Um, there's been rumblings for a while that Saudi Arabia might be interested in getting more involved with this format. Uh, we should make sure we manage expectations on what this format can achieve. It's a great way to you know, do joint training, share ideas, officer exchanges, uh, military education exchanges. Uh, and interestingly, you know, looking at a map, I mentioned that North Atlantic area, north of the Tropic of Cancer. Every country in the Middle East other than Yemen is actually north of the Tropic of Cancer. So it's certainly an area that NATO has an interest in uh, because what happens in the Middle East often spills over into, into Europe. Uh, so I think it would be great if in parallel to the 75th anniversary celebrations, we also think about how we can re-energize this Istanbul Cooperation Initiative on the 20th anniversary of that platform. Well, thank you, Senator Menendez. I really wanted to hear what you were asking about um, particularly China and the Indo-Pacific because I wanted to follow up on what I understand was Senator Van Hollen's um, questioning along those lines as well because um, obviously, well, participating in both the summits in Madrid and Vilnius, um, I got a chance to observe the the participation by four Indo-Pacific countries who were at both of those summits. Um, and there was a great deal of interest in the fact that they were there and very engaged. And um, as we look at the connection between security in the Indo-Pacific and security in Europe, um, you know, North Korea is providing weapons to Russia to use in Ukraine, for example. Uh, how, how do we better engage um, countries in, in those conversations around how to address security um, in both regions? And is there a role at the summit this spring in Washington to do that in a way that um, better raises the, the issues around the security connection between what happens in, um, in China and the Indo-Pacific um, and what happens in Europe and the West. Um, Ms. Varma, for example, uh, we had a hearing on Europe earlier, well, at the end of last year, and one of the things we heard is that the leadership is now, of Europe is now becoming more concerned about the role that China's playing in the world hasn't filtered down as much to some of the population in European countries. But so how do we make that, help countries make that connection between those security environments and how critical it is that we're talking to each other and recognize the role? And is there something we should be thinking about for the summit? 
Thank you very much, Chairwoman. Um, I do think people in Europe are thinking about the threat that China represents, but of course in a very different way than the threat than, that Russia represents on a daily basis. Uh, for now, we see difficulties coming from China, mostly from an economic point of view, which is why we'd like actually to increase um, discussions uh, around China and, and global issues inside an EU-NATO framework, because as Luke Coffey said, financial instruments pertain to, to European institutions and not to NATO. But there are many areas on which we could work together to better, better coordinate. I think the invitation to the IP4 in the past two summits is already a demonstration of what we've seen in a number of official, of official documents in the US, in Europe, notably in the, uh, in the UK's uh, integrated re re refresh, which says that security, uh, the security in Europe and in Asia are indivisible, which means that challenges in both areas, of course, have impacts on each other. The NATO strategic concept of 2022 also outlines this. But NATO as an organization, as a political and military alliance, has a remit, which is the Euro-Atlantic area. And so I think we should also be mindful that for the time being, at least, this is where we're working at. Doesn't mean that we can't talk of these challenges. I think we mentioned them, we were explicit that we share those challenges. But there are a number of countries in Europe that don't believe that NATO is the right place to do so. Fears of escalation, perception of escalation on Beijing's part as well, though, again, uh, the strategic concept, which the strategic concept and the strategic compass, which is a similar document produced by the European Union, clearly identify Russia and China as our main threats, our main challenges, and so we need to do to to act towards them. But I'm not sure that NATO is the right place to do that. And so, do we think that sentiment is what ultimately um, defeated the effort to put a NATO office in Japan? There are many reasons for that. I think one of them was that the proposition was put to the press before it was put to the table of decision makers, uh -huh. and so it didn't help, I think. Um, there are NATO points of contacts in embassies around the Indo-Pacific region. Um, in Japan, Denmark is the point of contact. In South Korea, France is the point of contact. So I think these discussions, they already take place. NATO has a number of partnerships with Indo-Pacific countries. It is absolutely clear that European Union, the European Union member states, European countries, the US, have a variety of shared interests in the region, and so we need to work much closer together. I, this goes beyond the question of a NATO liaison office or not. It's about us being clear, clear about our shared vision, our shared interest, and our capacity to act on them. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sir, if, I, if I may add, I think the single most important thing we can do with regard to those four key U.S. bilateral allies, but NATO partners, right, is to, is to help Ukraine win the war. I mean, this is not only a very important message to any potential competitor in the Indo-Pacific, China, right, but it's an equally important message to our allies Absolutely. in the Indo-Pacific. So it's a two-part message. And, and, and it goes back to the fact that the, the single most important deliverable for the Washington summit is a clear commitment that our objective in Ukraine is to win. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Mr. Powell? Just that um, the issue of credibility amongst our friends and the issue of deterrence amongst our adversaries in the context of Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific is a very important one that's accentuated by the fact that Remember in February of 2022, just six months before, the world was watching Afghans fall off the wheel wells of C-17s. Uh, so had we suffered an immediate defeat, if the West had suffered another blow in Ukraine, I suspect the, the hearing today could very well be on China and Taiwan, um, and not NATO and, and Ukraine. Uh, so it's, it's about reestablishing our, our uh, ability to deter adversaries and recommit to our partners and friends. And that's why Ukraine is actually the way to enhance our position in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you, Senator Ricketts. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think to your point there, Mr. Coffey, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Kishida said that uh, Ukraine today may be the East Asia of tomorrow, to your points. That's certainly a view that's believed not just here in this room or in Europe, but also uh, in Japan. So I do want to hit upon this a little bit more, though, because uh, Ms. Varmi said that maybe what part of the problem was that the liaison office with the AP4 was somewhat hampered by the fact that it was released to the press before it was talked among members. 
do you think it's a good idea that we have that liaison office in Japan? I'm not sure that the office, the liaison office is the main issue right now. I think we need to be concrete in our partnership with Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, other partners as well in the Indo-Pacific region who want to see a high-end investment of Western countries. And, and that can take many forms. I don't think the form it takes is what is central here. I think the strength of our commitment, its consistency, its seriousness is what will matter. And to, for our partners to see that we're serious about Ukraine, that we're serious about European security, that we're serious about ramping up production of ammunition and missiles, that we're actually on a war economy footing in Europe, I think that is what concretely makes a difference. Yeah, certainly that would be a concrete step. Are there other things though? I mean, perhaps uh, if, if uh, you know, because establishing a liaison office would certainly be a concrete step, very tangible, people would be able to see it. Uh, what about instead of uh, you know, a standing invitation to the AP4 rather than ad hoc to NATO summits. Would that be a concrete step we could take? I think that could work. They've been invited to the last two. They're invited to this one. As I said, if we're saying that the security of Europe and Asia are indivisible, I think it makes sense. They can have a standing invitation. I'm guessing there might be others who at some point would want an invitation too. So we also need to think about what is so special about our willingness to partner with the Indo-Pacific partners. Are we thinking about whom other can, could ask for such a standing invitation? I don't, I don't, I'm not opposed to it, of course, but I think it also has ramifications that we need to think about. Okay, great. Actually, uh, thank you. Uh, that's a uh, great answer. I'd like to, uh, both of our other panelists to kind of weigh in on the concreteness of establishing a liaison office or a standing invitation or another step that we could take with regard to the AP4 and some of the implications of it. So, Senator, I think a standing invitation makes sense. In fact, it's very hard to imagine that having attended two now, right, that somehow we break that pattern because it, it's no longer important. I mean, if anything, uh, I think increased participation of the AP4. So perhaps um, commit further to uh, one of the foreign ministers' meetings every year uh, having an AP4 session or one of the defense ministers' meetings. These, these are you know, standard sessions throughout the year in NATO. So uh, a standing invitation on a, on a regular, predictable basis, I think, makes a lot of sense. I, I'm with uh, Tara in terms of the importance of the office. Um, what's more important than the office is not losing the cohesion of the alliance because you can't gain consensus on the office. So raising the issue when you don't have the consent, I mean, look who I'm talking to, the, the, <laughs> the, the, those who have to get votes, right? If you don't have consensus at the alliance, then the issue shouldn't be raised because it's only going to be divisive. So it's, it's not, that's not as important uh, as, uh, as I think the periodic and routine invitations. Great, thank you. Mr. Coffey. I, I agree with, with everything that was just said on this subject. Um, and those are issues taken at the high level of affairs of state with a lot of symbolism and importance attached with how NATO engages with uh, partners around the world. I would like to tie it just briefly back to, to Ukraine and how that impacts the Indo-Pacific in more practical uh, military ways. Uh, you know, we are exposing the shortcomings in our, in our defense industry today while Americans are not being shot at. Uh, so to better prepare ourselves for the future, imagine the situation we'd be in right now if the U.S. was involved in an armed conflict against a country like China and we're just now discovering the shortcomings in our defense industrial base. We are also learning what weapons work and what don't work on the modern day battlefield and our defense industry is taking great steps to modernize, update, and transform these weapons to make sure they can be lethal and we have an advantage on the modern day battlefield and they're learning all of this from Ukraine. Uh, we're getting newer weapons and munitions in our stockpiles that could better prepare us for an Indo-Pacific scenario. Many of the weapons we're providing to Ukraine are technically expired or soon to be expired and we're replacing these with newer systems and munitions. And then finally, we are learning ways to arm Taiwan faster. Uh, because of the success of the presidential drawdown authority being used for Ukraine, for the first time last year, the PDA was used to arm Taiwan. Because of the effectiveness of the HIMARS system on the modern day battlefield, uh, Taiwan has now been moved up the queue in terms of when they will receive 
uh, high Mars systems. So we're learning all sorts of lessons, both at the high level affairs of state, but also at the lower, more tactical military side of things as well that will help us in the Indo-Pacific. Madam Chairman, I just have one quick follow-up. You mentioned uh, the expired weapons. Actually, somebody just mentioned this to me that, for example, we would pay the vendor to retire our expired weapons, like somehow they don't work as much, I guess, I know, or whatever. But if we've got these, say, uh, uh, expired HIMARS, do you know right now, are we actively looking to give those to Ukraine? Is there any sort of barrier to doing that versus paying somebody to actually dispose of those? This is an ongoing debate. Uh, I, I do know that in October, the United States gave an undisclosed number of long-range attackums missiles uh, using the uh, cluster mun it's the cluster munition right. variant. And the Ukrainians, in one night, and probably over the course of two or three minutes, however long it took for that rock those rockets to launch and hit their target, took out about 12% of Russia's Ka-52 attack helicopters. Uh, in a matter of minutes. Had we done that in the spring, before the uh, counteroffensive, Russia would have had a lot less uh, uh, tactical air capability to go against the Ukrainian armor. But once again, we're giving Ukraine what they need to, to, to survive and not enough to win. And if we do have these weapons sitting around about to expire or being decommissioned, we should be giving them to Ukraine. In fact, some of the uh, social media footage that was released in the aftermath of that attack uh, at those two Russian air bases on occupied Crimea, uh, Ukrainian territory showed the manufacture dates being in the early 1990s. Uh, so we should be do we should be saving probably the American taxpayer money, helping our our partners in Ukraine win by providing these weapons. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate but, it. But sir, if I if I just go, quick follow up, I do think that even the provision of those older systems requires additional presidential drawdown authority, right? So this, I mean, unless unless we come to a convention where if it's if a weapon has exceeded its shelf life, its value goes to zero and therefore it's either demolished or it's provided to Ukraine, there's still a dollar figure assigned to that, the provision of that capability. So it, eventually it comes back here. Well, but that, again, that was kind of my point though, is if we're paying somebody to dispose of them, those weapon systems now have a negative value to us because we have to pay to somebody to dispose versus if we can give it away for quote unquote free to Ukraine, actually we would save ourselves the expense. And it may just be kind of the way the rules, regulations, laws are written that is preventing that, even though it would actually save us money rather than cost us money. That's a very common sense approach we should expose to them on Russian forces. Couldn't agree more. Um, thank you, Senator Ricketts. Um, I'm sure we remember in the early days of the war in Ukraine that we were trying to find um, a number of former Soviet republics that had um, munitions that the Ukrainians were used to using because um, getting people up to speed on some of the newer weapons was going to take time. So it's essentially the same discussion. Um, but I want to switch to the Black Sea because one of the things, um, one of the things that I think the invasion of Ukraine has done is to make the rest of the world appreciate just how much um, we have been dependent on Ukrainian um, grain, uh, not just here in the United States, but really around the world, and what the impact of cutting off those sea lanes um, when the war started has meant. Now, obviously, Ukraine has really fought back. They're now exporting more grain via the Black Sea than even before the war started. And, but as we, as we think about the future and the role of the Black Sea and trying to make sure that this situation doesn't happen again, what should we be thinking about and how can NATO um, be better engaged to ensure that we don't have this kind of um, blockade of the Black Sea in the future? So I don't know who wants to start so I, I think the war in Ukraine has caused everybody to bring out their maps, right? And to figure out where is the Black Sea, uh, why is it important, um, and to figure out uh, and to deduce the economic 
uh, implications of the war in Ukraine. So you mentioned grain, but it's also fertilizer, it's Absolutely. energy uh, stocks, uh, and so forth. And of course, there are a number of NATO allies that border the Black Sea. They should get special attention. But you know, fundamentally, your question points to the importance of Turkey, uh, who contro which controls the access in and out uh, of the Black Sea. And it goes back to this conversation we had a few minutes ago about values and uh, democratic principles and so forth. And here we have yet another case of where an ally, when it drifts from those three founding values, becomes a difficult ally. Um, and I think we've certainly seen that over uh, the Turkey episode, Turkish episode with regard to ratifying the accession of, uh, of Sweden. But that's not the only issue. Um, so it goes, once again, it swings back to those three founding values. Um, well, I'm glad you raised Turkey because that was my next question. And that is, how, how do we continue that relationship with Turkey, who is a valuable NATO ally? I think probably everybody would agree with that. But yet we see um, President Erdogan, who is hedging his relationship with Russia, who's been an outspoken supporter of Hamas in um, the war in Gaza. So how do we balance that and um, improve our ability to keep Turkey within the NATO family and yet um, hopefully address the values piece that you're talking about, Ambassador. And Mr. Coffey, you want to start with that? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll have a stab at that. With Turkey, it's important to look in, in the long run, in my opinion. There's been a lot of problems in the bilateral relationship with Turkey. Uh, but Senator, as you said, they're an important part of, of the alliance. And I am not quite ready to throw away about eight decades of a fairly good security relationship for eight or so challenging years under President Erdogan. So I think we need to think more long term here. On, on the issue of Turkey and, and NATO security and Black Sea security in Ukraine, it's, it is a fascinating one. Uh, you know, on, on, on balance, when I speak to Ukrainians, they tell me what Turkey is doing is beneficial, more in favor of them than Russia. But, you know, President Erdogan had an election that he had to, uh, to deal with. Um, you know, he, he wants to uh, make sure the economy is going. Russia is a big trading partner of, of Turkey. But then on the other hand, the Turkish closure of the straits clearly benefits Ukraine in this matter. I mean, I don't see how you could think otherwise. Uh, Turkey provided cluster munitions to Ukraine when the Americans wouldn't provide them. Turkey is building uh, Ukrainian ships in Turkish dry docks. Uh, Turkey has provided MLRS uh, rocket systems, um, cold weather gear, uh, armored vehicles, and of course the famous Bayraktar drones. Um, so, you know, Turkey in general, and Erdogan in particular, uh, is trying to perform this geopolitical balancing act in the Black Sea in a region that has traditionally for cultural, uh, his, uh, cultural uh, economic, and security reasons been a priority for Turkey. Ms. Marma. Yes, I was precisely going to say that. I think we need to be conscious of how much of a balancing act Turkey is uh, willing to play right now. I think that has, of course, disadvantages, but it also has advantages. If you look at uh, the fact that Erdogan finally unlocked uh, the Sweden accession, Sweden membership situation, I think we still have a number of uh, cards uh, in our pocket that we can play with Turkey, but we need to understand that this is what we're doing right now. And I this is where we might have an issue in the mid to long term because yes, NATO is a military alliance, but it's also a political alliance. And so there needs to be some form of a political cohesion, some form of political unity as well that we'll need to pressure Turkey probably a bit more in the coming years. Thank you. Did you have anything to add, Ambassador? No, it's hard, it's, it's hard to improve on that. I, I do think that um, Mr. Erdogan plays a very delicate east-west balancing act uh, and he plays it very well. Uh, and um, I think the kind of sustained political pressure that we saw placed on him with regard to Sweden's accession is the sort of thing we must be prepared to marshal in the future on different issues, um, maybe access to the Black Sea or, or, uh, or uh, whatever. Um, so it's possible, it's just he's a very good deal maker, um, and we should appreciate that. I, I'd also offer, though, we've talked a lot about values, that the most important 
press back against those values, uh, drifting from the values, comes from the public themselves. So what we saw recently in Poland is an inter interesting case, right? Where you had a Polish government um, which was significantly drifting from the values of both the EU and NATO, and you saw a change of government um, because the Polish people stood up and demanded a change of government. And at the end of the day, I think that's, that will happen eventually in Hungary and I believe eventually uh, in Erdogan's Turkey. Um, well, thank you. I think that's a, those are all interesting insights on um, Turkey. I, I want, before we close, and I, I don't think any other senators are coming back, but I have to take this opportunity to ask you all about the Western Balkans, which is an area of Europe where um, we've had in the last 15 years, as I said in my opening comments, not only welcomed Montenegro and North Macedonia, but also Croatia in the NATO alliance. Um, but there are still aspirant countries there. Bosnia, Herzegovina is one of those. And it's a part of Europe where NATO has played a very important role in, during the breakup of Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia. And um, one, of, one of the areas of real concern is the um, political and I think security situation in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, sadly, I think due to the successionist rhetoric in the Republic of Srpska by Milorad Dodik, um, it's a place where there can be real um, security challenges and NATO continues to have an advisory role with the U4 mission there. So should NATO reconsider Bosnia as a security challenge and um, look at doing more to push for enlargement to include Bosnia, doing more there to support what's happening in the country? Svarma. A number of countries in the Western Balkans have been very frustrated with us. They feel like they've been put in an- With us, Europe? With us, US? With Europe us, and jointly? US. The West, let's say. Okay. Um, they feel they've been put in an antechamber for a very long time. They've been promised something that actually we've never been serious about until now. The opening of accession negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova to get inside the European Union, hopefully with Georgia as well, means that down the line and not very far down the line, we'll have to consider the Western Balkans as well as being part of the European Union. So that will mean a massive enlargement of the Union. Um, economic security, but also traditional security. The EU will have to provide that. We'll have to be serious about it. That will mean implementing massive reforms inside the European Union that we are thinking about right now. But it is clear to me that the future of the Western Balkans is inside uh, Europe, not only because they are prey to massive Russian and Chinese interference right now, that should not be the only reason why, why we need to do it, but it is certainly one of the reasons. So, yes. Senator, I came back from Kosovo yesterday uh, in order to come to this hearing. <laughs> um, and so I've been watching the Balkans since days of the Dayton Accords back in the mid-90s. It's really unfinished business. For NATO. I mean, it's the soft, vulnerable underbelly of, of Europe. Um, as Tara mentioned, it's, it's a playground for Russian uh, misinformation, disinformation campaigns, interference in election processes, and so forth. But I don't, think, I don't think the armed conflict threat is as high as the political instability threat. So, so I think alongside our partnership, NATO's partnership with the EU, we ought to focus on the politics here. And, and in Bosnia in particular, at the, what, 20, 30, gosh, 30 year anniversary of Dayton is coming up next year. Um, let's think about the durability of, has Dayton accomplished what it might accomplish, putting an end to the conflict, but it did, did it really provide a reasonable path forward uh, in terms of a political resolution? And I, I think it's wearing thin. Um, well, since you just got back from Kosovo, let me ask you, because um, Kosovo and Serbia still have um, an unresolved conflict, which has flared up in last fall in ways that were very distressing. So is, is K4 equipped there to address potential violence should it arise? And um, what should NATO do in that um, 
area to de-escalate. Well, you're right. The northern Kosovo, southern Serbian boundary is a potential flashpoint in the Western right. Balkans. Um, K4, I think, has actually performed to standard. I mean, in most recently, it didn't get in front of the violent uh, the violence uh, episodes between Serbia or Serbians uh, and the Kosovo government, but it responded quite quickly. And I mean, in one such episode, some two dozen uh, K-4 soldiers were actually uh, injured uh, as a result of the civil unrest and so forth. And since then, NATO has demonstrated that it's not leaving Kosovo because it's uh, committed its reserve force right. to reinforce K-4. So K-4 is still alive and well. Um, I think alongside, again, alongside the EU, uh, there needs to be uh, consistent pressure on both sides to move towards what they agreed to do years ago, uh, which is to stabilize the relationship and provide essentially for the Serbian minorities in Kosovo a predictable future uh, and one that features security. Uh, and then also for the Kosovar government to provide the kind of security that they don't have to worry about their larger uh, northern neighbor. Well, it would be helpful for Serbia to also um, address its behavior as well. Um, so I lied, I have one more question. Because um, one of the things that I have um, worked on and that the Congress passed in 2017 was the first um, legislative directives around women, peace, and security. And it's been, I think, um, a successful initiative that still has lots of work to do in terms of the potential to better engage um, women in conflict areas and to also look at how, um, how um, militaries can better engage. So can I ask, as you look at NATO, what's the potential role for NATO in better adopting um, women, peace, and security as a way of operating? So, um, Senator, as a father of three daughters, one of whom is here today, ah. uh, and uh, as the husband of my wife, Jane, who served both in senior levels of the US government and senior levels at the United Nations. I'm a full believer in this. Uh, I also think, frankly, that the empirical data here is pretty compelling. It's when, very compelling. When women are involved in conflict resolution and negotiation processes and so forth, you have a much greater prospect for success. Now, that actually defies some of my relationships with my daughters uh, in terms of uh, negotiating uh, ability. But I, I think the data here is pretty clear. NATO has a special representative for women, peace, and security. Uh, and she traditionally has a very vocal role at NATO headquarters. I think the most important thing, though, is the power of example. So when you have US ambassadors like Kay Bailey Hutchison and Julie Smith, uh, serving in difficult, challenging times with such distinction. There's no more powerful message that the United States of America gets it uh, and is willing to put the women that we need where they can best serve the country. So I'm, I'm a big proponent. Ms. Varma. Absolutely. I am a huge proponent of it as well. Women, peace, and security is about two elements. One element is the hu human resources element, which I think is crucial having women in power, women as role models, to have an inspiration. Um, I think that's absolutely crucial. Yes, for little girls and teenagers, but also for little boys and teenagers. I think that's important too. The second element is the substance part of it. I think to be able to say that we look at issues through a women, peace and security framework is still probably one of the Copernican revolution that we need to improve a little bit. I think the fact that NATO adopted a human security perspective is really important to say that actually NATO, which was a very traditional security, uh, political and military alliance, is thinking about climate change effects, how women are especially target to rape, that rape is a weapon of war everywhere in the world. That was true 50 years ago, it's still true today. We see it in Israel, Palestine typically. Right. To see these issues come to the forefront of public debate and for them to be endorsed, I think, by an institution like NATO is absolutely crucial. And is there a role at the summit for um, discussion of that? 
Well, I hope there is. I think what we're seeing again in the Middle East right now is women are particularly targeted. Uh, we need to bring that to the forefront, and I would hope that one day it's not just women bringing these issues to the forefront, but men do it as well as women. And we've seen it in Ukraine as well. Yes. Mr. Coffey. Yeah, actually, uh, bringing this back to Ukraine is, um, a, is very important. Uh, perhaps one of, the, one of the most iconic photos of this war was the one of the mother walking her daughter to the train station in civilian clothes with a yellow armband on her right arm with an AK strapped on her back. And that actually served as an important reminder that it's just not the Ukrainian armed forces that are at war, it's Ukraine society. And guess what, women are 50% of that society. And the Ukrainians have actually done a great job in recent years um, in, in increasing the role of women in the armed forces. This was one of the big reforms after 2014 where they opened up more combat roles to Ukrainian women. In, in 2016, uh, women only accounted for about 8% of Ukraine's armed forces. By 2022, that had doubled. Um, and, and there's now about 48,000 women serving in Ukraine, and this is an increase of 40% from uh, 2021. And they are many times on the front lines. And I can tell you, as a former U.S. Army military policeman, I saw the important role that uh, the female soldiers could play, especially when it came to law enforcement uh, and other uh, military operations. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great initiative and NATO should continue to focus on this and look at Ukraine as a model. You're absolutely right. I've had a chance to meet with a number of those women, uh, Ukrainian women soldiers, and not only are they good soldiers, they're good messengers for why we need to support the Ukrainian cause. Well, thank you all so much for your compelling testimony and for taking time to join us. And uh, hopefully we will see you at the summit. Thank you. Now, officially, I think the record stays open until Friday at close of business. And um, so if there are any uh, questions for the record, we need to have them by then. Thank you all very much. At this time, I'll close the hearing.